in at Albuquerque. The gag writing in the Warner Brothers cartoons is really relentless. It just does not want to stop. We can see their approach to gag writing is that they just give us gag after gag. Sometimes they will even put one gag inside another so that it's not until a few seconds later that we actually know we've had two or three things happen at exactly the same time. Anybody can think of a million funny things for a character to do. You know, how about they, uh, you know, get stuck in an airplane that's out of control? Well, okay, but who are the guys that are stuck in the airplane that's out of control? How are they reacting? And that's, you know, that's the hard work. That is like the rocket science uh, writing that I think the Looney Tunes team did so well. We're on! Vaudeville. I think very heavily influenced the Looney Tunes cartoons. They took like old vaudeville routines a lot and stock vaudeville characters, so it gave them a weird new spin. As far as the gags go, they got an awful lot of material from radio that was common at the time and from screen comedy. Uh, they all claim that they used silent comedians as a big, big influence. Oh, we are the boys of chorus. We, we hope you like our show. show. We, we know you're rooting for us, but now we have to go. The three main writers of the Looney Tunes in their golden age period, the 40s, the 50s, uh, Warren Foster, Ted Pierce, and Michael Maltese, uh, all came to the Warner Brothers studio from New York, and they all came from working at the Fleischer studio. And it's, it's, I find that very interesting because the Fleischer studio was the big, the, f the funniest cartoons of the 30s with Popeye and Betty, but those are very funny cartoons. I'm a space cop. My name's Monday. My partner's name is Tuesday. He always follows me. When you watch the Looney Tunes, um, and you watch them enough, individual writers and story men start to make their sensibilities and their various talents known. You look at somebody like Ted Pierce, and he was much more into the parody element than a lot of the other writers. So a lot of the Daffy Duck cartoons he did, such as Stupor Duck and Rocket Squad, were parodies of popular shows of the time. And he would take Daffy and to some degree Bugs and put him in a situation where their personalities, but you know, doing a lampoon of a popular show in another medium. Ted Pierce was both a story artist and a voice artist. He actually provided the voices for some of the characters in the Warner's cartoons. Oh, the brakes were against you. I'm a flopperoo. I can't even get the boy. Don't worry, you'll get it all right. You mean I'll get it in the end? Yeah, and you'll get a big bang out of it, too. We had Mel Blanc doing Costello. You had Ted Pierce doing Abbott. Ted Pierce was extremely funny. One of the funniest guys in the world. I mean, just as a person because he looked like Ichabod Crane, but he was very elegant. And he came from Upper Crest, Pasadena and Santa Barbara, you know. Grew up and he was this, he looked like Barrymore. Moonlit waters will sing <laughs> of the tender love you bring. Warren Foster was sort of the songwriter of the group. He did a lot of cartoons where the characters do rhymes or sing songs that he would write in his cartoons. Uh, Foster's name is attached to some of the completely wackiest, zaniest cartoons that were done, including some of the early Robert McKimson cartoons and the Bob Clampett cartoons of the 40s. Push in, plenty of room in the center of the car. Push in, plenty of room. Push in. I used to wake on the shuttle from Times Square to Grand Central. One of his characteristic things was New York references. Bugs is managing a gorilla. He pops out of the street and he says, I used to work the, the subway between Park Avenue and Time Central. There's something that, that's very Warren Foster-ish about those lines. Well, I guess I'm the goat. What? Somebody like Maltese is a little harder to uh, categorize because he was adept at doing both um, very verbal cartoons like the Ducksters or the Rabbit Seasoning cartoons, and yet he could do pantomime cartoons like, like the Roadrunners. Maltese is best known for his wordplay, that sort of thing. That, and that was something that obviously Chuck Jones was fond of. Uh, Maltese also had a knack for uh, putting in references to things like opera and, uh, you know, more highbrow material. And again, something that Jones uh, Appreciate it. I'm not a nice guy. 
And I'm not gonna let you in. And I'm not gonna lose my job. But I am gonna throw you out. Preston Sturgis or Billy Wilder couldn't have done these better. Michael Maltese really uh, was at his zenith when he wrote these cartoons. But they wouldn't be as funny if they weren't executed so perfectly by Jones. The writers left because they could make more money in Hannah Barbera. And they rewrote the same cartoons at Hannah Barbera and sold those and did real well. And then John Dunn, who was a very good writer, came in and he helped. He was very good. The one that Frizz, you know, to his dying day, thought was the greatest genius of all time was a fellow by the name of John Dunn. Frizz just lit up like a Christmas tree. All of a sudden, there's this great new creative talent. Uh, and he would come to me and say, this guy's so much better than Mike and Ted, I can't believe it. And another thing he brought to the table was he would actually create a board that was almost as good. You could almost put the board into production. He drew so well. The writers at Looney Tunes, you know, were really artists. They were really cartoonists also. And when they drew up a script, uh, they did it like a comic book. You know, it was done with storyboard panels. They even put word balloons and things on it. And the whole point, it, when, it, when it's comic strip form, is to be extremely visual. Everyone should have a hobby, don't you think? Man is making love. The best kind of gag, in my opinion, is the kind of gag that where you laugh out loud. It could be that people are laughing internally, but you'll never know that. The only way you know that somebody's enjoying themselves for sure is if you can hear them laugh. And especially in a session like they had at Warner's where they brought in all the directors and so on into a room and uh, would gag these things up. Chuck Jones once told me that they would have what they would call a, a, a no session where nobody was allowed to say no to any gag idea. They just threw them all out on the table. They just you know, kept coming up with idea after idea after idea, and they all went in the hopper, and only then, after they had as many ideas as they felt could fill up a seven-minute cartoon, did they start shaving them down and taking the best of them. And would never say no. I mean, the old Japanese custom, you know, in Chinese and Japanese, they don't have any word, you no know, basic word for no because that's a shut, you shut, shut the door on that, on another person's uh, intelligence. So I would say, look, this doesn't work for me. I just, I, doesn't, I don't rise to it. Uh, but it might work for Frizz, or it might work for Bob McKimson, it might work for God, but it doesn't work for me. And I'm the one that has to put it into work. The director worked with the writer right from the outset. And the only person that, that uh, the writer had to please was the director. The uh, writers they had, these fellows would draw the storyboard, they would put up on a board and then act it out. And then if Frizz or Chuck had a dispute or a disagreement with one section of the board, they would just take a push pin and fold over one corner and he'd get back to that and fix it. Almost like they put you in a room and just leave you alone. Say here, you know, with other talented people and just bounce gags off of each other, you know and see what happens, you know, don't, don't plan anything. <laughs> the, the, the main thing is don't plan, you know, just let it happen. And I think that's, a, and it's not only fun, but, but it, it really is creative. It was crazy because we were having, making fun with each other. You know, we had prop stuff that we'd get out of the prop department. We'd all be wearing German helmets and rabbit ears and all kinds of things. So it was kind of playtime all day long. You know, we'd take a work break once in a while. But we had fun. That was, I think, the secret of the whole thing. You know, just the fact that we were like a big family. I think that in comedy writing, or probably any kind of writing, I, I, I would guess, that once you know who your characters are, then figuring out what to do with those ultra well-defined personalities becomes exponentially easier, and then part of the fun for the audience comes from seeing those characters react in the inevitable way that you know is coming because you know the personalities of these characters. Usually it's, a, it's not a plot, it's a situation, really. And um, create a conflict. That's, that's what all the cartoons are about. And then we'd see how many guys we could get off of that subject. So Sylvester and Tweety 
it would be probably an interior thing, so everything that happened would happen with things that were in, in, in the house, you know. There was not only a team there, an overall Warner Brothers team, but there was a reason for the consistency and a kind of a house style, even though the, the individuals within that house had their own imprint on the cartoons. Oh, I come out of our blast child. For shame, Doc, hunting rabbits with an elephant gun. As a comedian and as an animator, as a writer or a director, you can make any rule that you want and as long as you live by it. You can make up a rule. It becomes logical because you use it, because you adhere to it, because you're honest with it. Take Laurel and Hardy, for instance. The, uh, one of the, their basic rule is based on, an, on a thing that, that you can't hit me while I'm hitting you. It's not as silly as you might think. If you run a price fight and run it in very slow motion, you'll see that one guy hits the other guy there's a hesitate and the other guy hits him. Very seldom do price fighters knock each other out. Very seldom do they hit at the same time. So in a way, you're taking this other thing that's perfectly logical and extending it. And it's quite honest to do so. If you get a good rule, oh, well, you sure live with it. But you can make it up. It doesn't require anybody to, to put the stamp of rationality on it. But you can't do it once. You've got to do it so that it's believable. This time I will be real smart and use my head. <laughs> Animation is one of the greatest mediums in the world because you can have control down to the frame. These guys had it down to a science. You know, Chuck Jones knew that when the coyote fell over a cliff, it would take 14 frames, not 13, not 15, 14 frames for him to completely disappear before you saw the puff of smoke come up. And it's that kind of precision that really is the difference between a laugh or not. All of the directors would say one frame would make the difference. Looney Tunes paid attention to the idea that the punchline is not the most important part of a gag, it's the setup. The important thing is to establish a really comedic atmosphere, an atmosphere that's electric and has expectation in it. It's risky because if you announce that you're gonna do that and you don't do it, boy, you really have egg in your face. But you have to be a risk taker to do good cartoons. Hey, what's the idea? What's the idea? There's supposed to be a barrel here for me to hide in. It says so right here in the script. Somebody's been laying down on a job. JL will hear of this. We made them for ourselves, really. And, and we had the remotest idea what the public would react to, you know. Other than the guy would say, is that gag funny enough? And other than funny, by funny, they meant, is that violent enough? <laughs> they were so inventive. Even their, their gags were so crude and, and rough, and uh, but they've never been done better. <laughs> they never. I sure do love Rabbit. I, rabbit! I think being exiled from the main Warner Brothers studio and having to work in a rather ramshackle establishment known affectionately as Termite Terrace gave all the guys at the cartoon studio a feeling of it was us against the world. For the most part, they were the outsiders. And that's always a good fuel for comedy. Comedy doesn't come from complacency. Comedy comes from adversity, sometimes from anger or frustration. Uh, and if you channel it in a, in, a, in a positive way, you can come up with some really good results.